Let's discuss contracts. Uh, under legal obligations, remember we have a contract and uh, we are going to be we are going to be discussing contract for the rest of the of the syllabus. Okay, what is a contract? And a contract is a legally uh, binding agreement between uh, two uh, people, right? Uh, it has to be legally binding. Uh, for instance, uh, two people must enter into a contract, and uh, there must be consequences for not uh, for breaching uh, that particular uh, uh, contract. For instance, uh, there are glossary of terms which you can, which we use in uh, in contract. I'm not going to discuss all of them, but I want us to discuss the reciprocal contract vis-a-vis -vis, uh, unilateral contract. You know, we can get unilateral contract. A unilateral contract is where one party acts as a debtor and another party acts as a creditor. These um, examples are a contract of donation. For instance, the person who is donating acts as a debtor and the person who is receiving the donation acts as a creditor. So one party acts as a debtor and the other one acts as a creditor. This is a contract of donation or drafting of wills. Okay, the testator, the one who is drafting the wills, acts as a debtor and the other one who is supposed to inherit acts as a uh, creditor. So this is a unilateral contract. But most contracts are reciprocal contracts. What is this contract of employment, contract of lease, contract of, um, uh, of uh, purchase and sale. These are reciprocal contracts. What does it mean? It means that both parties act as data and creditor at the same time. Think of it. I know I'm twisting your accounting, accounting knowledge. <laughs> right. Uh, both parties act as data and creditor at the same time. Can parties act as data and creditor at the same time? This is how. For instance, you have T in a contract of sale. You have T who is selling his bicycle to, to X for 500 US dollars. T is selling his bicycle to X for 500 US dollars. T is the data when it comes to delivering the bicycle to, to X. So because he has a duty to deliver the bicycle to, to X. And at the same time, X is the creditor when it comes to receiving that bicycle. But when it comes to payment of money, this $500, X is the data. He's now the data when it comes to payment. He's the data and T becomes the creditor when it comes to payment. So both parties act as data and creditor at the same time. It depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, the, the payment of money, $500, obviously X has a duty to pay. So he is a debtor. When you're talking about uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, delivering the bicycle, T is the debtor because he has a duty to deliver the bicycle to X. So both parties act as data and credit at the same time. So all these contracts like employment, contract of purchase and sale, contract of lease, contract of insurance, these are reciprocal contracts where both parties act as data and credit at the same time. For instance, look at contract of employment. The employer is the data when it comes to payment of salary. At the same time, the employer is the creditor when it comes to work being done. And the employee becomes the data because he has to perform. I'm sure you, you understand this. Now, let's move on to the requirements of a valid contract. For instance, there require, the, the are requirements for a valid contract. For a contract to be valid, it has to comply with five requirements. These requirements, they have to be complied with. And they are five. That is, number one, we have consensus. Two, capacity to act. Three, possibility of performance. Four, legality. And number five, formalities. These are the requirements of a valid uh, contract. And they, they all have to be proved for a contract to stand. These 
requirements are from common law, they are the same. Even if you go to America, Canada, South Africa, they are the same. They, they are from uh, the Roman uh, Dutch uh, law. And they are there. They are the same. So we have to prove one by one. Prove them one by one. And we are going to start with consensus. But I'm not going to discuss everything. I will uh, let you read on your own. If you have any questions, you come back to me so that we we discuss. But how is consensus reached? Number one, uh, it is reached when there is intention to be contractually bound. Parties have intention to be contractually bound. Number two, they have common intentions. Common intentions meaning that uh, both parties, they have the same contractual commitment. For instance, let's say Z is leasing his house in uh, Borodale or let's say in the Benside to T for 5,000 US dollars. Z is leasing his house to T for 5,000 dollars. And T hears as if the house in Borodale is being sold for 5,000 dollars. Obviously, these parties do not have the same contractual commitments. They do not have common intentions. Why? Because Z is thinking of a contract of lease and T is thinking of a contract of sale. So they do not have, cons there is no consensus ad idem between the two of them. So they don't have common intentions. So they can never be a contract. Right, number three, making of intentions known through offer and acceptance. Both parties have to declare their intentions through offer and acceptance. In every contract, there has to be an offer and acceptance. So one has to offer, one has to say, hey, I'm selling a VW, and the other one says, yes, I'm buying that VW. So that's an offer, that's an acceptance. So just uh, read through the definitions of an offer, definition of acceptance and requirement of a valid offer. Okay, requirements of a valid offer, you can uh, read through, but I want us to focus under requirements of a valid offer. Let's focus on uh, an advert. Right, let us discuss the status of an advert. If you see something uh, advertised in the newspaper, let's say you see a laptop advertised in the newspaper for um, 200, 200 uh, uh, RTGS. Okay, 200 RTGS, a nice laptop, um, let's say it's, a, it's the latest brand, uh, Apple uh, laptop, going for 200 uh, RTGS. It is advertised in the newspaper. You run to that shop. Maybe it's, it's uh, being sold. It's advertised as being sold to OK Mart. You go to OK Mart and you actually find a price tag of 200 RTGS on the laptop. You are so excited that you take it to the till. Right. At the till there, they say, oh, sorry. Sorry, sir. We made a mistake. Actually, it's supposed to be 200,000, and they add three zeros on the price tag. Can you then say, no, 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 you guys, you made an offer, and I have accepted, so you are bound to sell this laptop for $200. So can you reason that way? Because remember that an offer plus acceptance equal to consensus. That means you have agreed if there is an offer. So can you then say a price tag or an advert in the newspaper is an offer and therefore you have accepted once you take it to the, then you, you decide, you, you say that you have accepted, so there is a contract. No, in Crowley versus Rex, they said, an offer 
or a price tag. An advert or a price tag is not an offer, but an invitation to do business. They are just inviting you to come and do business with them. So when you are taking the laptop to the till, you are the one who is making an offer to the till operator, which can either be rejected or accepted. So if they say, no, 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 we have made a mistake, they are telling you that they are rejecting your offer for $200. So there is nothing you can do. You cannot approach the courts for that. So you can read a case of Crowley versus Rex. It's in your module. And also Pharmaceutical versus uh, Boots. So you need to know that an offer, if you see an advert in the newspaper, no, it's not an offer, but an invitation to do business. They are saying, hey, come and do business with us. Okay, rest you can, you, you, you can read. Um, then we come to, to special offers. Special offers. Under special offers, we get, um, for instance, uh, options. There are three uh, special offers which we are going to discuss. There are three. We get options, two, we get preferential right, and three, offer for reward. Offer for reward. Let's discuss this uh, option. Let's, let's discuss these special offers. For instance, let's start with options. What is an option? From the definition, it's, a, it's an agreement between the option grantor and option holder in terms of which the option grantor keeps for acceptance an offer for a certain period of time. Okay, let me demystify. I know that you got nothing from this um, um, uh, definition. For instance, we are saying that there is this person, T, right? T is um, selling his house to Z for 500,000 US dollars. Right. Z says, I don't have the money now. May you keep this offer open to me for two months. Right. Keep this offer open to me only for two months while I look for the man. Right. If T agrees, they then enter into a contract. They would have entered, I mean, they would have entered into a contract of an option. You would have given Z an option to purchase the house within two months. Oh, the, uh, you would have uh, given a certain option to come and say, I did not even get the money. So for these two months, T is not allowed to sell the house to anyone because he is bound by an option contract with Z. So Z has two months to make a decision. Either to come with the money or to say, I did not get the money. So within one month, let's say within one month, T is approached by W, who says he wants to buy the house for one million US dollars within a month. So we are saying T cannot accept this one million dollars from W because he is in a contract with Z. He has given Z two months of which for which he can uh, accept or uh, decline a contract. Okay, so this is an option. We say T has given an option to Z. So, who is the option grantor? T is the option grantor. Option grantor. And Z is the option holder. He is the one who is holding an option which he can exercise within uh, two Month. So this is an option contract, but uh, if you are the seller, please do not enter into an option contract. It's not uh, to your advantage. 
right then it's distinguished preferential is a is an option is distinguished from a preferential right or a right of first refusal what is that right of uh, first refusal in this case just say a same scenario T is not selling his house, but it is Z. It is Z who goes to T and says, Should you decide to sell your house, may I be the first one to get an offer? This is Z approaching T. Should you decide to sell this house, may I be the first one to get an offer? This, is, uh, th this actually happens maybe in lease contracts. For instance, someone has been leasing... Uh, the property for 20 years says to the landlord okay should you decide to sell this property may i be the first one to receive an offer it's reasonable i mean to offer it to the sitting tenant than to other people uh, outside so this is the scenario if t agrees then he would have entered into a contract with z and his support whenever he decides to sell that particular property he has to approach Z first. So Z has to be given a preferential right or a right of first refusal. So this is what we call right of first refusal or a right, a preferential right. So only Z uh, is supposed to be given that opportunity when it is being uh, sold. Let's say he decides to sell. T decides to sell maybe in 10 years' time and, and uh, sells it to X. So Z can go to court and sue T for breach of contract. Because he's supposed to offer it first to Z. Z has to refuse to say, ah, no, I don't have money, or you can sell, it to, you can sell the property to anyone. Then that's when he's free to approach uh, X. So that's a preferential. Right. Then we have an offer for reward. Offer for reward. You can read the three cases. Three most important cases which you must read and understand. Number one, Bloom versus American Swiss Watch Company. Number two, Lee versus American Swiss Watch Company. Number three, Ara versus Clark on offer for reward very important and this principle have a tendency of sneaking into the examination wall and uh, causing havoc for students let's move on right of course you can look at maybe the the jurisdictional uh, theories Declaration theory, expedition theory, reception theory, and information theory. Uh, these are not uh, complicated. So if you find any complicated uh, uh, thing or complicated principle which you don't understand, you are free to, to call me. And then you move on to the factors affecting consensus. Factors affecting consensus, there is misrepresentation, uh, there is uh, a duress, and there is also... Uh, undue influence and mistake. So these you can also read. Then move on to capacity to perform juristic act. The second requirement capacity is straightforward. You can, one must have capacity to enter into uh, contracts. For instance, children don't have uh, uh, capacity to enter into uh, contracts, right? So you must differentiate um, uh, age groups. For instance, you find zero to seven, they cannot even enter into any contract, even if they are being given a donation. They can't be given a donation, okay, in the absence of their guardian. So zero to seven, they cannot enter into any contract. They must enter into contact being assisted by the legal guardian. Then when I talk about 8 to, to 17 years, they have a limited capacity to act. Limited in that they can only enter into those contracts where they derive rights and not duties. 
For instance, a contract of donation, they can enter into a contract of donation. So, factors affecting capacity, we have age, we have marriage. Marriage affects uh, consensus, uh, uh, capacity. We have mental incapacity. Insane people cannot um, enter into contract. Influence of alcohol or drugs. Insolvency and prodigality as, as well. Prodigality. Remember the story of a prodigal, prodigal son who went to a far country. Yes, so these are the factors affecting uh, consensus. If you are confused or you don't um, understand a certain principle, please come back to me. But uh, I think this is just uh, straightforward. Okay. Then another requirement is that requirement is physical possibility of performance. We are saying that performance to which the parties have agreed must be capable of delivering. One must be able to perform in terms of the contract. If you are not able to do, perform, then there is no contract at all. For instance, this is a situation where the car which you have bought for your, for your wedding, Right, you buy a cow now, but uh, both parties are unaware that that cow is, uh, has, been, has been stolen. Okay, we are entering into a contract now, but we don't know, we, we, we don't know that the particular thing, that particular thing we are buying has been destroyed, or has died, or is no longer there. Okay, so we are saying that it is physically impossible to deliver that particular thing. Thing does not exist at the time of the conclusion of the contract. So we are saying, as a requirement, thing must be possible. If, if we are talking about uh, something which we are buying, it must be there, or it must be possible uh, to be uh, delivered. Then there are three forms of uh, impossibility of performance, and you can read it in the case of Cradwell versus Taylor, important, and uh, you can read all those. Then we move on to the requirement number four, which is legality. I mean, the agreement must be legal. Contract must be legal. I mean, it must not be contrary to public uh, policy. You know, it must not be contrary again to the statutes. For instance, selling DACA. This is, that's an illegal contract. Even if you're not paid there, you cannot approach uh, uh, the courts. Okay, so what's, what's the law of uh, legality? What are the consequences of an illegal contract? Let's say that you have, you have become notorious and you have actually entered into an illegal contract, as we do. Most of us enter into illegal contracts, you know. We may say, ah, no, we don't sell Dacha, we don't sell Banja and all that, but we enter into illegal contracts many times. For instance, uh, who hasn't entered into a, 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 a contract where you are changing uh, foreign currents from the streets? Okay, we, we have all done that, so we are guilty. This is an illegal contract. So, if you enter into an illegal contract, what are the consequences? Let's say that X sells a bag of Daha to D for 50,000 US dollars. That is 50 kgs bag of Daha. Now, X has sold and delivered to D, but D now doesn't want to pay $50,000. Says, ah, do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, he knows that this one cannot go to court. So, what are the remedies in this scenario? It can be maybe changing of foreign currency. It can be any other illegal, um, illegal uh, deal. For instance, maybe one in construction, maybe you have asked someone to build a brothel for you. 
you know, it's known as it's a problem, you know. So he starts building uh, that uh, that problem against uh, the laws of uh, this country. So we are saying this is an illegal contract. Now, what happens if one has delivered an illegal thing to D? For instance, we are talking about drugs here, and D doesn't want to pay. Can he approach the cause? D doesn't know. Can X approach the cause? No, he cannot because contract number one is void in total. In total. It's void. Contract is void. There is no contract to talk about because this is an illegal contract. It's not recognized by law. Number two, no obligation arise from, arises from this contract. There is no obligation. No one is supposed to do anything because this is an illegal contract. Then there is another principle. Exto because an non-auditor active. What does it mean? It means no one can claim from a scandalous cause. So if the cause is scandalous, if it is an illegal contract, you cannot claim. So that means X cannot claim $50,000 from D in law. He is bad. He, you, you, he, you know, dirty hands. You know, you cannot approach the cause with dirty hands. And number two, uh, there is the Pat Litam rule. Pat Litam rule says whoever is in possession has a stronger right. So who is in possession in this case? D is in possession of 50,000 and also Daha. So he has a stronger right. So he can keep this uh, Daha. And this one doesn't have any remedy. That's why they resort to shooting each other because there is no remedy at law. Right. But however, in some cases, of course, these cases will not go to court. This one will not approach the cause. For the, but there are some cases which, you know, sometimes we can um, condone certain illegalities. For instance, changing of foreign currency and uh, some other illegal activities. You know, yeah. So we, we can, the courts may intervene in illegal contracts to do justice between parties. So the courts can intervene to say, ah, no, 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 there is an injustice. Can you, maybe, they, they can intervene to do uh, justice. This was the case in Dube versus Kumar. Dube versus Kumar. <sighs> I wish it was another, you know, person, not Dube, no, I wish it was another surname. Let's say maybe Spanda or you know um, uh, Dinaro versus uh, uh, someone else, but it had to be Dube. So listen to the facts of this case. Dube was in an adulterous affair with Kumar. Hmm. Then there was municipality municipality regulations to the effect that a person was not allowed to own more than one house in Bulawayo. Dube already had a house, so he was not eligible to have another house. In order to facilitate his adulterous affair and to circumvent the municipal regulations, Dube bought a house and registered it in Kumano's name. Hey, okay? love was hot at the time. As time went on, their relationship soured. Beyond reconciliation, and this is to be expected anyway. And Dume demanded his house from Kumar. The question that the courts had to determine was whether or not Dume was entitled to his claim since this was an illegal contract. Right. What do you think was the decision? The court held that the contract was illegal. But the unjust enrichment principle had to be involved to prevent Kumalo from truly from unduly benefiting. The court that thus ordered Kumalo to transfer the house to Dube's name. Because Kumalo was just going to be unduly uh, was going to, 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 to unduly benefit. So they said, okay, transfer the, the house back to Dube's name. So Dube. Two houses. I'm sure the city council took the 
the house after that and Dube was a happy man. Right. Still on legality. There are certain illegal contracts or certain contracts which are deemed to be um, contrary to public policy. For instance, restraint of trade. Let's talk about restraint of trade. Restraint of trade is where uh, you are restrained from working for a competitor. Let's say you are working for Telesar and you sign a contract and in that contract there is a clause stating that should you leave Telesar, you are not allowed to work for a competitor like maybe Econet or Net One. Right. For a period of five years. So this is a restraint of contract. And this is a restraint of trade. Is it legal to restrain the person from working for a competitor maybe for five years? Is it legal? They can only remember that we are talking about um, two rights here. Two rights are in uh, conflict. Number one, we are talking about the right to choose and carry on any profession, trade or occupation. This is section 64 of the constitution. So this is a constitutional right to choose any trade of your choice to work for any company you want to. It's a constitutional right. And on the other hand, we are saying there is a principle in law, in under common law, the sanctity of contract. That contracts have to be honored at all times. Remember that you would have signed this contract stating that you are supposed you are not supposed to work for a competitor for a period of five years. You would have signed that contract. So we are saying that sanctity of contract detect that you must abide by the contract. So which right will take precedence? Is it the constitutional right section 64 or the common law uh, principle? Now, seemingly that the common law principle will take a precedent. Contracts must be honored at all times. And courts, in most cases, they favor the continuation of a, a contract rather than to declare it a nullity. Right. So, we are saying that when it comes to these cases of restraint of trade, Restraint of trade will only be legal. It will only be justified if, number one, it protects a substantive interest. You must, you must justify that you are protecting a substantive interest. For instance, trade secrets. It may be justified that you don't work for a corner or network after leaving uh, Telesa. Okay, but uh, the way you live matters. For instance, if maybe, let's say, you have been retrenched, yes, you can work for Econet, there is no uh, restraint, but let's say you just willy-nilly, you just get an offer from Econet, they are offering you seven times what you are getting from Telesa, and then you decide, ah, let me jump ship, let me go to Econet. That one, you'll be uh, bad by a restraint of trade and it will be justified to do so because they are protecting trade secrets right so they they don't want you to go with the secrets their secrets to the other company so it is it is uh, important and again number two it must be reasonable it must be reasonable yeah five years five years is reasonable but you can't say you cannot work for a competitor for the rest of your life no that would be unreasonable because trade secrets change over time. So if it is a, an unlimited uh, period of time, then it will be unjustified. It will be unreasonable. So that restraint of trade will be illegal in top top. So you can read all these cases, Myarazi Mangwana versus Brian Muparazi and, uh, and others. So you can read those cases. Thank you very much.